Um, yeah, anytime, I suppose. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, Harman doesn't need any introduction. Um, yes, I do. You do? <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, every, everybody should get the, the, uh, no. the grand tour. <laughs> the, you know. uh, so Herman is a high energy astrophysics type who works on AGMs and things like of that sort uh, at MIT. And he is bringing a new problem um, to CHAST. So um, uh, people online and here, I mean, if, if you know uh, anyone who might be interested in problems like this, please spread that around. Uh, and how take it Okay, so um, we're talking about, um, uh, it's been recorded, I thought. Yeah, yeah we started recording, yeah. Um, uh, high energy neutrinos, this is a very interesting uh, problem in astrophysics, and it's part of what we call um, multi-messenger astrophysics. These, uh, this, uh, the, uh, this set of, um, uh, uh, stained glass window renditions represents the three uh, different uh, multi-messenger uh, approaches that we uh, know about now. Uh, this one's supposed to represent like um, like the Fermi Gamma Ray Observatory, um, you know, observing objects in space. This one over here represents uh, two black holes merging together and the um, uh, gravitational waves that you would uh, a measure from them, and the one in the center represents what the, what we call ice cube, which is an array of detectors embedded in the ice in Antarctica. And I'm, I'm going to talk quite a bit about what it is, how it works. Um, although that's not completely relevant to the statistics of the problem, it's just um, fun to sort of know what you're talking about. And uh, I'll get back to the the physics of neutrinos. Well, let's. Get started. Um, um, so the overview I'm talking about here uh, for uh, the non-physicists, uh, I'm going to talk about what a neutrino actually is and why it's interesting to us. Uh, how to detect a neutrino, that's not easy, especially these high energy neutrinos. Uh, the fact that one um, one neutrino was associated with a gamma ray quasar in 2017, kind of broke open the field for lots of people to suggest about how neutrinos could be formed in active galaxies. This is where the connection to astrophysics comes in. Um, and uh, uh, that one is a very interesting case. Hundreds of papers are being uh, have been produced and cite these results. Okay, so there's a significant interest in the in the community uh, for all this stuff. So I'm going to so uh, I'm going to address the, mainly this one question, uh, partly about whether or not other um, uh, gamma ray quasars are associated with neutrinos, uh, and if most, if not all, of the high energy neutrinos are associated with uh, quasars. So we've got the statistics and the possible validation of the statistic. That's where we're, where we're heading uh, today. Okay. Um, so um, uh, multi-messenger astrophysics, you can observe gamma rays, but gamma rays can scatter and get absorbed in the, um, on the way from some interesting source. Uh, one method that happens is that uh, the gamma rays can interact with the uh, cosmic background, and they're moving so uh, uh, fast that they see, um, uh, or these these particles, their cosmic rays, will move so fast that they see a very high energy of uh, photons up against them as they're moving away, and so they get scattered away, and then you can't see them. And that's also true for gamma rays, and they um, they scatter and absorb along the way. When neutrinos hardly interact with anything. And so they go through uh, straight from uh, the source uh, to the Earth. And these are some um, arcane interaction uh, equations that say how you get neutrinos, which is basically from um, particles, uh, the decay of a pion, a neutral pion uh, goes into... Can you, turn, to, yeah. can you turn on your video also? Because I don't think they can see the... Uh, 
I'm going to have to do something here. Yeah, just to turn the old video on. Um, just a second here. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to escape and then uh, Sorry, that, video. You know, uh, it, it's really not necessary. Oh, there you go. Good. No, it's, it's your laptop. I want the me meeting out. What? Meeting out. What meeting out? Like so? Yes, that was. Okay. And then I'll go back to hiding this. Okay, so we're still good? Yes. Okay, better even. We're better even. Okay, so we were talking about uh, how you get new, um, neutrinos on uh, the muon will de uh, decay into an electron, and you'll get some new um, neutrinos out of that. Also, if a, a proton hits a nucleus, breaks it apart, you'll get some particles, and that's that's where these pions uh, come from. So, uh, but it takes very high energies to do the, to get the neutrinos that we're talking about, which I'm going to uh, I'll get to in a minute. So, a little bit more about neutrinos. Uh, they're uh, as as the universe goes, or the uh, the history of physics goes, they're not even a hundred years old. Uh, they were postulated in 1930, but named by Enrico Fermi because uh, uh, Pauli originally called them neutrons. And to uh, uh, reduce the confusion, uh, these are little neutrons or little neutral particles, and they are extremely little by comparison to neutrons. So neutrons are heavy and inside the nuclei of atoms. Okay, so neutrinos. Uh, as named by Fermi, uh, are these lightweight things. You need that to explain um, what we call beta decay of nuclei, uh, which is uh, when a nucleus is unstable and emits a, um, an electron or a positron. Uh, neutrinos were only uh, detected directly as of 1956, the year I was born. So that's my lifetime has been full of neutrinos, uh, apparently. Uh, they are extremely light. I'm talking about them in terms of EV here. Uh, as a reference, the mass of an electron in the EV is about 500,000, or five kilo electron volts. 500 kilo electron volts is the mass of, a, of an electron. The mass of a proton is about uh, an MeV, um, a million electron volts. So these are much lighter than normal, the, the so-called, well, the particles that make up ordinary matter that we see every day. Um, when, uh, okay, they, they weakly interact. Um, I, I had a little, I did a little calculation real quick and found that, um, that a neutrino, uh, going, a high energy neutrino can go through the earth about 99.95% of the time. You notice the, the earth, doesn't have enough mass to stop most of the neutrinos. It's they, actually much higher uh, value than I thought. Uh, well, that makes the point zero five percent are actually caught in the. Yes, but remember, our detectors are a tiny fraction of the size of the Earth. Yeah, we're actually using the Earth in large, um, uh, in a number of cases, but the, um, the flux as an absorber. Yeah, but the flux of neutrinos is so high. Okay. It's it's huge, yeah. It's like ten to the ten per square centimeter or something, something absurdly ridiculous. But those are low energy neutrinos because most of them are coming from the sun, uh, and those are uh, MeV style energies. So the energy of those is comparable to that in the nucleus because they're the result of nuclear decay. So you get this is the um, uh, the reaction network in the sun in the center of the sun to uh, helium uh, to hydrogen atoms. Uh, merge together. There's a neutrino that's produced. Uh, you get uh, a type of uh, uh, hydrogen called deuterium. Uh, that interacts with another hydrogen. You get helium. Um, that uh, interacts with another helium. You get uh, a beryllium. Uh, that uh, uh, radioactively decays into two different heliums. And that's how you get the merger of, uh, of these uh, helium, you know, these two hydrogens and this helium into two heliums. Um, when, oh, sorry, three three hydrogens plus a helium give you these two um, uh, two heliums. Anyway, the point is neutrinos are uh, are uh, are released um, along the way, and their energies are comparable to the uh, nuclear energy, which is comparable to the new the uh, mass of the actual 
proton, which is NEV style. Yes. Is the nuclear energy the same as binding energy? It's basically the binding energy of the nucleus. Yeah. And so that if you put enough energy into the nucleus, uh, which is comparable to the mass of an uh, of a proton, you will uh, uh, break apart the uh, the atom, uh, break apart the nucleus. Yeah. Okay. So um, they were first detected from supernova 1987A. And one little fact is that of order 99% of the total energy released in a supernova, which is the, one of the brightest things in the entire sky at any given time, uh, but 99% of that comes out of neutrinos, act, and actually, uh, with a certain uh, uh, and, and energy of MeV. And that actually started multi-messenger astronomy, which is part of this TDAM um, uh, acronym, which is time, um, things, domain. time domain uh, uh, astrophysics and a multi-messenger. Time domain and multi-messenger astrophysics. Okay. I thought the A stands for avocado. <laughs> <laughs> In your sandwich, it does. That's right. Okay. So uh, because uh, these neutrinos have such a high um, uh, or sort of low probability of going through the Earth, uh, you have to have very large detectors, uh, and you have to be uh, careful because lots of other things uh, can produce signals that look like what a neutrino would look like, um, and you have to be very patient. Uh, it takes a long time to see these things. Yes. Um, is twenty MeV or so the maximum energy that you that people are typically interested in detecting, or is that even higher? Um, they were interested in those back when they were trying to understand the sun, and the solar neutrino was a problem for a while because they didn't have enough solar neutrinos that they were measuring when they first started measuring the the, the number of neutrinos from the sun, um, and that. Uh, eventually evolved to the uh, possibility that there are actually several flavors of neutrinos, three flavors, and what you can have is that a neutrino is produced, but then it changes into a different flavor, and if you only measure one of the flavors, then you've lost some flux, okay? And so that was a very important problem, but that problem solved, okay? Someone got a Nobel Prize for that, okay, for, for measuring that. Uh, now we're on to you know, greater things, and that's what the Ice Cube Observatory comes in. <clears throat> uh, it's out uh, at the South Pole. It's embedded in the ice. It's uh, a kilometer across at the top. The uh, detectors are um, buried in ice by drilling into the ice and um, inserting a long string of, uh, of detectors. Uh, they call them uh, digital optical modules. They're basically photomultipliers. They're just measuring a lot of light, okay? And the ice is relatively clear. Um, so when something interacts nearby and a big flash of light occurs, uh, you can measure uh, what uh, that uh, what the event looks like in the uh, this string of um, these strings of um, of detectors. Uh, the energies of neutrinos that they're talking about measuring here are 300 TeV, so tera electron volts. So that's 10 to the 12, as opposed to 10 to the 6 for an MeV. We're going past GeV and into uh, TeV, and then even up to what we call EeVs. As I think it's exa e volts, ex exa electron volts. Yeah, and hardly anybody uses that because they're aren't really that many of them. Maybe there's been one. Okay, anyway, so you gotta do all this stuff on the South Pole. It's really fascinating. There's a website, uh, it's really cool. Here's what a track looks like. Um, there's a little movie here uh, on their website of neutrino comes in, hits a particle. The particle produces a shower, um, or, or sorry, uh, a, a particle is emitted that's moving faster than the speed of light in ice. And so it produces a lot of radiation. I'm not sure if this rate, this thing is going to work. There we go. Here's a, a, a shower of light that go, makes a track in the detector. So the the, um, the neutrino isn't interacting in the uh, uh, in the ice. Or sorry, in the detector, it's the particle that's produced when the neutrino interacts somewhere else. 
And what you're looking at is the particle of and the light from that particle as it travels through the ice. Officially, it's called Chernikov light because the particle is moving faster than the speed of light in ice. Um, so very high energy particles. Um, and so that, that uh, cone of light is very narrow. And so that means you can tell the direction that the neutrino came from by, by sort of um, uh, by backtracking literally along the track. Uh, and they've got timing to na nanoseconds so they can tell um, where, uh, you know, where the light started and where it ended um, as this uh, cone of light traverses through the ice. That's what uh, I think red is early and green is late, something like that. So these are the color codes here, right here. Um, the arrival time, the, red, the, 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 the light that's produced, you know, to, uh, hit here first and um, nanoseconds, hundreds of nanoseconds later, it goes there. By the way, light travels about a foot in a nanosecond. So that's how you can, if you measure something to a nanosecond, you can measure it to it, measure when that light um, got there to a border of second. Then that signal has to be sent up the lines up to the um, uh, up to the system at the top. Okay, so you can measure them. Um, so uh, they've uh, been doing this for um, well, at the time of this paper, seven years ago. They had seven years of of data, uh, and were uh, and they produced a statistical map on the sky. Uh, with hotter hot spots uh, indicating that there's a higher probability that there's a source there than there is at some place where this probability is low. Okay, so now we can start concentrating on, uh, well, these are some details about how you do the measurements there. Um, th this one is the average um, size or of the region of the sky for which you can measure where the neutrino came from. Okay. And so at the TEV range, we're talking about half a degree, half a degree on the sky. Um, sorry, is that, is that the yeah, coverage or the resolution? That is how your ability to take the track and see where it originated so on the sky. Size of the piece. It's, uh, it's an error region on the sky. Okay, a, a probability zone sure. on the sky for each, for each event. And then what you can do is sort of cluster the events, um, adding the probabilities together for each particular event to be in a particular location. And then you get regions that have uh, log P or negative log P. So this would be, and this is, you know, in units of 10 to the minus, uh, you know, or in, um, in dex. So a probability, uh, uh, sorry, a, a priori, a priori probability. So of, of 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five, but they have about 200,000 independent positions. So you have to multiply by your post, uh, by your trials in order to get the significance of any particular one. And what they say is that you need a statistic value, which they use as the log of the, um, or, uh, two log of the ratio of the likelihoods, where the likelihood is uh, given by the number of um, uh, events that contribute to the likelihood at any given point in your map relative to that where there's zero flux. So this would be the number of estimated counts in a given region, might be say 10, okay, um, compared to the likelihood of having zero counts there. So they, they try to figure out the, the joint likelihood of all of these, of the overlaps of these probability distributions, these likelihoods, okay? Uh, now there's, um, okay, so when there's a cluster of them, they get a little higher point, as long as the cluster is within this sort of half degree zone. So they're, they're, this likelihood of zero is effectively, they're trying to figure out what the background is from the data? Yes, exactly. Is that they have to, uh, that, the L of zero is the likelihood that it's zero signal, but uh, there it's a background uh, that's in their detector, let's say, because they're trying to see if there are astrophysical sources. Okay. Um, is this test test statistic um, based on the 
for the entire range of energies of neutrinos, or is this for a particular subset? Um, they only did they did this only over a certain energy range, and I forget exactly what they did. You can see uh, what they're working on up here. I can't let me just I can't even read it myself. Um, looks like um, uh, one to um, ten thousand. Uh, TeV. So they're looking at a very specific energy range, the highest energies, and it's that's because they are though different definitions. Looks like it says delta, it says duties. So yeah, the yeah. Oh, the, the, the colors, the, the colors of those uh, of those lines indicate uh, different ranges of um, location on the sky, because uh, you've. Um, let me see. I think. Okay, because for one thing, uh, you've got the Earth in the way when you're looking, it's on the South Pole, right? So if you're looking north, you're essentially looking through the Earth. And so you have to look at the tracks that, uh, where the neutrino interacted inside the Earth or inside the ice uh, and produce a particle that then was observed in, your, in the ice. Okay, so it had to go through the Earth first. The others are so-called upward looking, Okay, as opposed to downward looking. So the Earth, you know, gets in the way, and therefore you, uh, different declination zones have different probabilities of uh, being uh, detected as a function of energy because the tracks are different if you go through the Earth versus coming in from uh, from above and interacting in the ice. Okay, so we're going to be particularly interested in the southern hemisphere, which looks like the. Um, the dark blue uh, lines here. So they have a lot of effective area above um, uh, above a thousand TeV. And so that's where most people concentrate on finding uh, blazars because the background is, is somewhat lower there. Uh, the confusion with other kinds of sources is much lower and it's physically more interesting. Okay, so with 100,000, with 200,000 independent positions, they estimate a pretrial test statistic value, uh, which is equivalent to a Gaussian of uh, 5.67 sigma in order to get uh, three sigma significance. So 99.5% chance of one over the entire sky. And uh, they don't have any. Okay, so this, this probability map you see goes red and yellow. Um, when you get to these higher um, log Bs, and they don't see any, I don't see any of the uh, red or yellow. I don't see any of those hot spots in here. Okay. Anyway, this paper, Artson, 2017, concluded that there were no individual sources, and that all of these neutrinos are consistent with just coming uniformly from the sky. Okay. That's Can not I what other people. What? Can I ask a que question? Yeah, go for it. I'm a little confused about that. There, maybe I, mi I missed the discussion, but it, there's clearly some extended structure, especially in the in the south, in in your plot. How, how isn't that inconsistent with the statement that there are no sources? Are I'm I guess I'm saying what are blobs at the, at the bottom of this of this map? I don't quite, yeah, I don't quite understand why some of the southern hemisphere uh, sources seem, or probability, part of the probability map seems to be so much uh, wider than others. Uh, I believe it has to do with your ability to localize an event um, and that it's different when you're looking at them coming from above, uh, from the ice versus from below, because um, uh, the when you're looking at it from above, uh, your interaction has to be in the ice above your uh, your detectors, as opposed to in the earth, and therefore the and the tracks can be um, more well localized if they're coming from below. But I'm not really sure exactly. Yeah, but of course one clue is that they seem to be aligned with those dashed lines that you were discussing. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's a clue right, that it has to do with the orientation of, of, of it relative to the horizon. Because uh, at 
from from uh, minus uh, 90 degrees, you're looking straight up. And um, and when a source is on the equator, you're looking exactly horizontal. You're looking at your horizon at from the North Pole. So South, South Pole, either pole actually, the equator. Okay. So um, this is you now. Now, Artson may sound like a weird name, but um, and. It's the reason why that's the lead author is because they're like nine hundred dollars, okay, and it's alphabetic because it's one of these. It's basically a um, high energy astrophysics experiment. So um, the it's uh, anyway. So the um, uh, the names are in alphabetical order. So you have to make sure that they put in much more of the reference uh, in order to get the right artsen because there are artsens like all over the place for the neutrino. Um, ice cube results. Okay. It also means if your last name starts with a double A, go to high energy physics because you have a good chance of being the first one. <laughs> AAR is actually too, is, is, is probably not that good. There's Aharonian, which is AAH, which is a -A better than that. But... Yeah. Aharonian is the lead author on many uh, uh, observations from uh, Fermi and, uh, and Hess. Yeah. Yeah, because he's a collaborator on that, on those experiments. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, that's the that's a so this is an official Ice Cube team paper. Okay. Um, now there are other um, there are some other results, and this is and I'm going to be using a lot of um, uh, using a lot of results from a presentation uh, by Sarah Busan. Um, and I'd like to pause here to just say that I got. I heard about this subject by going to a meeting about three, about a month ago. Um, uh, and Busan uh, gave this talk about uh, identifying blazars with neutrino events. And I expressed a bit of skepticism in terms of the statistics. Um, and um, uh, we got together afterwards and I said, well, I'll present the topic to stat statisticians here at Harvard. So that's why I'm talking here is due to, due to Sarah meeting up with her at a meeting, which I think is a very, you know, one good example of why you go to meetings, you know, because you can really meet people and talk in detail about things. So this one case is really very interesting. Um, uh, she wrote on the top of this, this is her figure, um, uh, that cosmic interference may originate in blazars, and it's mainly because of this, uh, this one, uh, um, this one neutrino, actually, which is a very high energy neutrino, it's it's got a label a, a, a label a, a, you know which is basically the date 2017 uh, September 22nd. It's the A the te um, the A neutrino of that day. Yeah. So this energy that they that they measure uh, comes directly from how how far this track extends in ice cube or something like that. Um, or do they have some of them there? I can't say that I know that, but uh, I suspect because uh, you can measure the divergence of the Cherenkov light, you'll know the gamma essentially of the particle that produced that Cherenkov light. Uh, the okay. reason I was asking was um... the, the, the relativistic Doppler, uh, yeah, the relativistic Lorentz, the Lorentz factor of, yeah, of that. I, I guess my, my the more basic question that I had is. When they detect this Cherenkov track, there is no doubt that they detect it. And yes. It's zero oh yeah, one. yeah yeah. They they get a hit. They have a um they have a set of detectors at the top of the ice as well, um, uh, and they use that for as a veto uh, for random signals coming from different directions, uh, uh, and that means that any track they see they get in a large number of the strength is very likely from um, a, a, um, an, um, something that's away, uh, outside the Earth. Okay. And what if it's not a neutrino, it's a radioactive um, decay within the crust of the ice? Or something? Low energies, right? Um, a radioactive decay is uh, tens of M MeV, uh, those neutrinos, and they're not, they're, they're, they're looking for hundreds of TeV. 
Okay, these are very high energy uh, neutrinos. So no confusion <clears throat> to detect a neutrino at 183 GeV. That that's yeah, uh, and that's part of the reason why uh, the experiment is, is such a large collaboration. You need people that understand all the statistics, all of the detector um, sensitivities, um, uh, all the different kinds of particle physics that could be confusing because there are muons all over the sky, cosmic rays. They've measured cosmic, cosmic rays as well. And anyway, that these are highly identifiable, interesting, odd events. So this one had such a high energy that it had a very um, small uh, error region on the sky, uh, less than uh, a couple of tenths of a degree, or so less than a square degree uh, at the 90% confidence. And inside that, uh, this is a, uh, a map of, uh, that it, this, this contour region is shown on a map from uh, Fermi, which is a very high energy gamma ray detector. And so now you're looking at GeV photons in this map, and there's a source of GeV photons. Now this GeV photon, these, those photons are way smaller energy than this one neutrino, but you get more of them, okay? So there's, it's a sign of that there's a very energetic source of, uh, of um, or a compact uh, source of energy uh, right there. That source is called TXS 0506 plus 056. And I gotta say, I had never heard of this before 2017 when they when when this uh, paper first came out. Uh, it was published uh, jointly with uh, uh, with Fermi, I, the Ice Cube team, uh, another um, <clears throat> cosmic ray uh, detection um, a group, and it was uh, worthy of science because that one was already enough to say, hey, it's it seems pretty likely we have an association with gamma ray sources. Okay, so um, it's not just that. It looks like it also flared um, and that if they go, because they found um, a neutrino from around this area, pretty close, they went back to look at all the other neutrinos they saw and saw a cluster of them in time that was, um, you know, kind of, Beyond the probabilities, that's what this is right here, according to their, according to that paper. I'm not going to address that here, but um, uh, uh, so that seems kind that of. There are no sources. How do they find this cluster? Sorry, who said there are no sources? I mean, the previous slide they had this thing, but it's uh, a different paper. These people think they can do better. Ah, they found yeah. something, though the other paper said there isn't. And these yeah. people say they didn't look carefully enough, they didn't use the right statistics, there is something. So they're actually um, the there, but there's another point here that the previous paper, well, whatever, um, uh, was averaging over seven years of data. They just they summed up all the events over seven years. Okay. Now we're looking at a single event and where it came from. And said, "Oh, look, that one may come from this one place." Yeah. And you look back at the at all the events that came from that one place, and here's a little cluster of them, and they're saying that those are more highly clustered than they should have been if they were from an average background. Now, I'm not going to address the probabilities. I, yeah. Can I interrupt just for a second, Herman? I, I, you may have said this, but do you do you know how well localized the neutrinos are? For, for their like their sky coordinates relative to that gamma ray source. Um. Well, uh, generally, uh, we're talking about to within uh, plus or minus a half a degree. And that's the, the degrees are this. Oh, so this this I see. So uh, it's 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 reasonable, reasonably. So yeah. yeah. So here's a, a declination of five point eight for the center of this. You go plus or minus 0. 0.4 um, degrees, and that's the 90% error region. Right, and and the, and the cluster that you're that we see above are all from more or less that region. More or less, I didn't go through that paper in detail to find out what their criteria were for selecting those events uh, to put on this time dependent plot. So one must thing to emphasize. Like the, the map that was shown before was not time dependent. 
And so if you take a yeah. particular place on the sky and you decide, yeah. hey, maybe there's a time dependent phenomena, you might find something yeah. else. But yeah. of course, you, the other thing that this does, yeah. Yeah, the other thing okay. that this does that the other doesn't do is take advantage of that that of the gamma rays. It, it, they, that that's a it knows that that's a place to look or there's an unlikely coincidence or mm -hmm. something like that. Or somebody said, "Hey, we think they may be uh, gamma ray sources," or they found a catalog that had these sources and look, oh, here it is in this catalog. There may be other things in this field, in this direction of this thing that we don't know about because we just don't have a catalog since then enough. But there's that source. That one's there, and it's a gamma ray source. And people have reason to believe that gamma ray sources, high energy gamma ray sources, GEV level gamma ray sources, could also be the sites of neutrino, um, uh, a, a neutrino emission. And that theory goes back before there were even neutrino detectors. That goes back 10 or 20 years. That when, when high energy gamma ray were found from AGN, people already suspected that there might be neutrinos. Because the way you produce those gamma rays, it's like nuclear interactions, and there have to be neutrinos that come from those nuclear interactions. But, but high energy but, particles. Uh, Fermi, uh, Fermi lab data exists for this whole region, so you, um, I, I assume that anybody writing a paper like this would search the, the Fermi data for other, other sources, other uh, more distant AGNs or something. But um, well, they just don't show up at the level that this one does. Right. And there's another. One. Here, here's another AGN off to the side. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, it's in one of the catalogs. It says three FGL. That's the third Fermi gamma ray, you know, um, or whatever. There's a two different um, catalogs, I guess. So they're so the, the the sources are listed in the in these catalogs. Right. Okay? Yeah. So the, the, it doesn't look like there are other gamma ray sources in this region. Uh, associated with this particular error circle. So anyway, it led people to start saying, well, if this uh, if this little cluster of neutrinos really comes from this uh, gamma ray source, let's look at the possibility that other uh, blazars have uh, gamma um, have neutrinos coming from them. And now we start to see um, um, uh, more. Oh, um, and here's a little bit about the physics. I think I've sort of mentioned some of this stuff. Um, the high energy neutrinos are not from the normal, normal nuclear process. That's what I was saying. This isn't just radioactive active decay. Um, the energy density you need is extremely high and it's comparable. To, or you, it, the, the, the energy that has to go into making these neutrinos would, would be comparable to what you see in an active a galactic nucleus. Uh, and so there are, there are a few um, uh, possibilities for um, how you can produce them near active galaxies, near supermassive black holes. And this is just the spectrum here showing. We measure uh, in X-rays the spectrum of an active galaxy. And, um, and you can see most of the energy here is actually uh, in the optical uh, and infrared, whereas uh, over here, there's a lot of energy in the high energy gamma ray bands of GEV. Um, and again, that's where each photon has essentially the same energy as a particle of a, a proton at rest. And now we're talking about these neutrinos, which are at much factor of a thousand higher energy than that, or even or more. Okay, no factor of factor of a million higher energy. Okay, um, and uh, these high energy protons to get that high energy. Of uh, the, the Lorentz factor indicates that it would have to have a speed which is greater than 99.9% of the speed of light. And so in order to do that, you think that you're around an active galaxy. So if, if very important physics, and it's really important to, to nail down this whole thing. This is the kind of cartoon. Uh, protons are ejected by, um, or particles are ejected out of the core of an active uh, galaxy. Uh, proton, uh, these particles hit something, produce these pions, the pions then decay into 
uh, muons, those decay, and then you get neutrinos. And the neutrinos keep going straight, whereas the gamma rays go off in all different directions uh, or get absorbed, whatever things happen. Um, so uh, you can uh, perhaps see the neutrinos uh, from these things. Okay, let's, let's move on. So we've got, here's another map of the sky. Actually, I think it's prob uh, approximately the same map. And what they're doing is looking at anything uh, at any of the other significant spots, and they claim that there's one at 2.9 sigma, you know, at one of these locations here. I forget, uh, it must be this one over here. And then a couple of other places, and there's, again, TXS um, 0506. So um, they say that they've done a correlation with um, uh, the northern uh, northern catalog of different sources, and they've got a significant, eh, it's kind of on the margin of 3.3 sigma. I didn't look at that particular paper. Uh, I looked at um, a different paper on this group. Um, um, none of the individual um, sources are at high confidence, nor, nor are there any particular source classes at high confidence. And so this is really still pretty dicey at this point um, as to what we're seeing. Uh, extra galactic, okay. So uh, here's where we really get into the meat of what I wanted to uh, bring to this group. Um, this uh, uh, Sarah uh, uh, presentation was particularly about an analysis of southern sky hotspots in this catalog. Uh, she used a catalog of um, that is essentially the same as what Arsten showed uh, earlier. Looked at the uh, log of the p value, the probability that a, a given region of the sky is is um, um, is a source, and then. She decided to take a, or their team decided to take a list of known gamma ray emitting uh, quasars. Okay, so now you've got um, 177 uh, positions on the sky, and you want to find out how many of them are associated with these with these little hot spots. Actually, uh, the question kind of got me thinking. Sure. Um, do you know if they did any uh, removal of the galactic plane? Because in the last couple of years, when ICU has um, had a, had more news about um, measuring neutrinos that are coming from yeah. roughly in the galactic plane, I'm not sure if they can identify specific sources at this point, but they definitely have more yeah. of the galactic neutrinos. Yeah. So here, do you know? If, yes, um, I do know. Do you know if yeah. they were doing some removal, or is this still with looking at the entirety of without removing? No, they're looking at only the southern sky away from the galactic plane, and it's mainly it's mainly uh, about five degrees off, uh, and it's mainly because uh, uh, their catalog of AGN may not be complete in the galaxy either. Sure. Okay, uh, because they get a lot of confusion and a lot of unidentified uh, gamma ray sources in the galactic plane because there are random pulsars and other inter interesting things that you will see in the galactic plane. So they're, they're, um, they have limited uh, uh, this analysis to the southern sky primarily. And it's actually primarily because that's where they get their signal, it, it seems to me. Okay, uh, the table uh, probably could have blown up a little bit more. Okay, so, the, um, so they got these positions of gamma ray uh, quasars and they want to associate them with hot spots. Okay, these hot spots are about half a degree in, in, um, um, in radius. Um, they give a, a characteristic um, cutoff of this log P value that they're using. They say it's about 3.5 sigma. Uh, I have not independently verified that. Um, and what they really want to say is they've got 10 new possible candidates that are identified with these hot spots. Okay. Uh, and then they did some Monte Carlo, and that's that's an important point about this that I want to get into a little bit more. Um, how are we doing for time? Um, Great. Yeah, I'm actually almost done. So, what do do? so figure the last you know, bit of the discussion. So they have 1,100 uh, places on the sky for the southern southern catalog. Uh, they don't even look at the you know, the North Pole uh, five degrees um, and away from the south. Oh, that's true. That's the equator, minus five degrees. I thought they eliminated the galactic plane as well. Uh, anyway, 
they're working above 100 uh, TeV, which is that's a peta elect electron volt, a tenth of a peta electron volt. They say that they have 19 hotspots, okay, and that they have matches with 10 of them. 10 of those hotspots are matched out of these 1100 with that. And they say that the pretrial uh, probability is 3 to the minus 7 for any individual identification. And then uh, that gives a, uh, you know, that's kind of five sigma for an individual ID. But that when you consider how many hotspots they looked at, um, the post uh, trial uh, probability is 2 to the minus uh, 5. Two to the minus five, or four and a half sigma. So this is already rusting me with his binomial. No, yeah, yeah, we're gonna get there. Just, just moments to get. Okay, so they say that there are nineteen hotspots. I immediately have a, a, an interest in finding out what they, why they find so many hotspots at three point five sigma, uh, when the uh, when the other group said that there weren't really any, uh, you know, spots. Um, but this is this is a 3.5 sigma. I think at the local, you know, the uh, the pre-trial probability, just the probability that there's a source there. But there are lots of well, positions on the sky. So um, one of the issues I had is how did they find so many of these hotspots? Uh, and I think that what they're doing is they're they're moving down the probability uh, curve for uh, on the maps down to a weaker. Um, peaks in the map and, and saying, hey, are there any um, blazars associated here? Okay, so that's what they did. Um, I wanted to know more about how they validated this post trial probability. And I, um, I found that they did it by Monte Carlo um, validation. And that's what they're showing here um, is they randomized the blazar positions by about 10 to plus up to 10 degrees. So they moved them around, did a, a 100 million Monte Carlo simulations using those randomizations, determined the number of associations that they would get that were that satisfied their initial criteria, um, and then uh, determined the um, the uh, the change of the probability of the post trial probability. Okay, sorry, yeah, sorry. The the, the number of uh, of MC uh, um, runs that give you the same number or more hits, and they found that there was only a chance of a few in ten to the minus uh, seven. Okay, for uh, a a an association radius of 0.55 degrees, and so this is their signal. This is. This is their very low probability. And then when they do the post-trial. So, uh, so Mr. Why is it, why isn't there a minimum at very small R? At R equals zero? Uh, because they've randomized. Sorry. Um, actually, okay. Yeah, because the area in each circle drops that you're looking for an association. So you expand the circle, uh, you'll get more and more candidates uh, uh, falling in that circle. That just goes as our, you know, as that radius square, right? So the chance of getting a hit goes up as you. Uh, oh, so and, and they're not requiring that they, um, a, a particular AGM that they, uh, the, that they previously associated, associate with that R spot has to be associated with the same R spot. It could be something else that has. They're going to, they're going to get, they're going to, uh, so the ones that get a hit at small radio are still going to get a hit at larger radio, right? Just you're going to get more hits from elsewhere in your catalog. Yeah. Okay. They also randomized the hotspot positions, but since there's a declination dependence to the uh, to the effective area of the instrument, they kind of only uh, randomized in right ascension. So they they did some randomizations there. Um, I have some statistics questions, uh, some specific questions about calculations uh, that I I submitted or sent to. Uh, Sarah, the, this morning as I was working on this till early in the morning, um, I'm not sure why they tried three different values of this sort of the so-called L min, which is the cutoff for determining a neutrino hotspot. 
they did, they picked up 4.0 as the one that they were going to run with, and that gives a post-trial probability of 10 to minus, 2 to the minus 6. Um, the other two do not give such a high post-trial probability, so, you know, that's kind of cherry-picking after the, after you've, I don't know, I'm not sure how valid that kind of approach is, you know, statistically. It seems like you're defining your criteria uh, after you do your experiment. Uh, I can't quite figure out the um, uh, the p-values, uh, the the, pr the priors on the p-values. I think this is mainly this is probably something that will be close that will clear up pretty easily. And I think the they were they're talking about two and a half, uh, two and a half uh, sigma or so. So these are there are lots of these fluctuations, I believe. Again, remember they're talking about 190,000 uh, places on the sky where they could be looking. And, they, and so they selected 20 out of the out of the 200,000 uh, places on the sky. Um, they they actually made their maps in 0 0.1 degree bins. I'm not sure exactly why. The ice cube resolution is like plus or minus half a degree. I would think it would just mar want to marginally resolve. I'm not sure why they do this. I think it's because it gives a, you a slightly higher um, probability likelihood at the peak. You know, when you you're sort of like smoothing over a region, you're not pixelizing. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why they did that, but that's, you know, that's a technique thing, and I don't know. Um, Maybe it has to do with the energy resolution, like at very high energies, you can tell the small things. Um, I think there's still only about half a degree. Um, um, even for that 200 TeV uh, special case that, that they associate with TXS, um, that was half a degree radius. That's 200, uh, 200 TeV. That's above their threshold. So, um, and I plotted, I had a plot in there which showed the error region for high energy. It, it, it's approximately the same, you know, it's approximately flat. So I don't quite understand it. I didn't know why they also um, varied this size region and, 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 just, and then picking the one that gave the best probability. Uh, and I'm not sure why they didn't set it to 0.5 degrees instead of varying it, uh, maybe they tried 0.5 originally and got a p-value was only 10 minus four and said, that's not worth publishing. Let's try another value. I don't know. So I've asked that question too. Okay, now here is a very simple trivial calculation that I just talked about with um, with Vina before this. I just thought about it on the way in today. Um, if you take 0.55 degrees as your error circle, um, uh, plus or minus, okay, so it's a circle of radius 0.55 degrees. That's about five to the minus five of the sky that they're sampling, of the southern sky, okay? So uh, given that you're trying, uh, so you're essentially throwing darts at these little, you know, um, at these little areas and trying to hit that dart. If you accumulate, um, you know, if you do a thousand tries, uh, you're essentially, multiplying the area that you're available that's available to you by a factor of a thousand. So so the chance of getting a hit on one of these, you've just multiplied by a, essentially a factor of a thousand and to have about a, a, a five percent chance of getting a hit uh, with one of these thousand, two thousand uh, positions. Uh, and that means if they have 19 uh, places, you know, these hotspots, 19 hotspots, that you want to try, that's a, you would expect only one hit, and yet they found 10. That's actually pretty decent. That's a that's a posterior probability, binomial probability of like 2 to the minus um, 8. That's what we calculated. So I'm not sure why they didn't do that calculation. <clears throat> I would think, and so this is one reason why I'm bringing this here, is like, you know, what's the right calculation to do? You know, um, what's the right validation? Uh, I'm not sure about why they uh, uh, randomize the positions a uh, uniform on zero one uh, zero ten well actually it's uniform on a circle zero ten I presume I would think you would want to eliminate the inner region because that's association and so you'd want to use an annulus around there but that would make the post trial probably even lower I'm not really sure so I'm not sure how you go about doing like the you know like a random shuffling uh, that that would uh, give you a good uh, validation of this particular of these associations. 
Um, and just as a bonus, other people have done different papers and they have different uh, criteria they use in the selecting a sample. And some of them use the actual flux level of the blazar. Um, in this paper, they do not use the flux level of the blazar at all. It usually just hits with different blazars. Uh, it doesn't matter how bright they are. It's just a, it's a flux limited catalog. It's all of them down to some flux. So there's some bright ones, there's some faint ones. TXS was a fairly bright um, gamma resource. That was a good, that was a good case, you know, to make, you know, for, for blazars. I don't know that this makes a good case because I would expect. In, in the case of the TX, TX stress, whatever the thing is, uh, wasn't that a case also that there was a burst of neutrinos? So it's, it's that there needs to be, there's some time, uh, time dependence component to that. There, and that complicates all the matter of things as to what you want to use as your criteria that you should decide on. You got to exclude that source then start using that criteria for deciding about all the others, right? Because you want to test the hypothesis that variability is the reason yeah. why these things are being no, no, uh, detected. But, but Paul, I, I was just commenting on this last point here that um, maybe they don't care about the uh, flux, actual flux levels because the flux levels might change and they don't care. Uh, they're, they're actually excluding that. Those are, those are averages. They don't tell you how bright they were at one point. You know, they don't use the max. They don't use some, um, you, know, uh, you know, maximum flux that uh, the flux that a, any given one has achieved over the time period. You know, the seven years. I mean, of they're, they're not cube. matching it to Fermi-Alt sky uh, uh, data or anything like that. Right. So it's it's like any any time during this fourteen-year period, if you have a uh, burst, uh, then they they're going to see if that's a that's one. And, they picked a catalog, you know, it was good to figure out what kind of catalog to use. They just picked one. And there were other people that used different sample, different catalogs, and they get different answers. Uh, it's really important to understand, um, you know, whether or not this method, you know, and the sort of post hoc uh, cuts and stuff are are valid. And, I, and it may be a fairly short paper to talk about it, or an experiment, you know, a little numerical experiment or something like that. But I thought I'd bring it up because there are a lot of people running around talking about blazars as being neutrino sources. Uh, and I'm one neutrino. I'm a rather. I'm still a bit not convinced. So that's uh, that's why I brought it here. That's all I've got. Um, any other questions from the uh, from those online? Anyone raise hands? Yeah, uh, Jeff has his hand raised. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank, thanks for this really nice nice talk, Herman. And um, it's it's the standard, fairly complicated issue of exploring data at the beginning of a you know a project and then thinking you you found something. And I, ideally, what you do is you frame a hypothesis um, ahead of time and then apply it blindly to the data. Yeah, yeah. And looking around, as you, at the very beginning of your discussion of this slide, you talked about you know sort of post post facto cuts and so on. The, the minute you do that, you're in a whole new ball game, and you're sort of giving up the possibility of a, a totally objective significance analysis. Um, so I, I don't know if it it's a if you're thinking of going ahead and, and doing something, I don't know if it makes sense to sort of pretend that you didn't know all of what was done in this analysis and frame a, a completely straightforward detection criterion and, and sort of design the whole experiment and then blindly apply it without any um, fiddling around uh, with the results that that might be a step forward. Um, and just a footnote to that, on the other hand, different people doing that same exercise would start off with different um, criteria and different hypotheses. And so, and if yours, you know, if yours is the best of that sample, that's a biased um, sample of these experiments statistically. So it, it's, it's the, 
the, the usual problem that people don't talk about as much as they, they should, that any time you, you look at data and try to find a pattern and then and, and assess its significance, it's a very um, difficult, difficult business, but I'm just sort of ranting about that. So, but no, yeah, no problem. Um, I actually went through a similar thing when I was in grad school. Um, I actually looked at a paper by ARP, you know, Halt and ARP that assumed uh, that said that there were associations of quasars with galaxies and that there were lines of quasars on either side of a galaxy. Uh, and um, I actually looked at those statistics when I was a grad student uh, and got, and he quoted a probability that, you know, these things could be, could happen at 210 to the minus uh, six or something. And I worked through all the details and I found a probability of 0.2. But partly because he used his original sample that where he'd been promoting this idea and he, he added them into the uh, sample for testing his hypothesis. It's because he said, these are the ones that have been best studied and therefore clearly they should be in there. <laughs> so um, I, I have, I, I I understand your I understand that comment very well because I've seen that in action elsewhere. Well, that's that's a fascinating comment. I I did a similar exercise with the um, yeah. uh, TIFFs um, quantized redshift business, and, uh, mm -hmm. and that's another thing. But but the, your mention of ARP is interesting. I don't know if anybody has looked at it, but in gravitationally lensed AGNs could be what what he was actually seeing that is associated images because uh, with highly different redshifts um uh what background no. redshifted objects no. so believable is any do you know if anybody's has looked at that any of arps associations could it be gravitational lens systems i uh, like i said i did the statistics in in, in gory detail and I believe that uh, he picked up on a uh, a slight fluctuation uh, and then uh, ran with it and tried to make it more detailed. But um, he did, he made a lot of mistakes along the way. And his, 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 his calculation of the actual probability was wrong, too. He took two probabilities, two independent probabilities, and said, well, if either of these are true, um, uh, then I could just multiply the two probabilities and I get the chance that uh, that either one happens, but that's not not what you would do. That's it's you multiply them if it's that one and the other one is true. And he did, they just uh, he didn't do the calculation right. There are a number of things. Uh, I I wouldn't uh, I personally wouldn't want to go back to that. So uh, I think David had a question, but uh, before that, if I may jump in briefly, uh, so the true underlying data that you have are actually the events that are this uh, few hundred thousand um, uh, neutrinos that have been collected over the decade or something, right? 200,000 points on the sky, points independent the points on the sky. So with this signal. is like an event list. We can apply all of our, uh, everything that we have developed for extra astronomy uh, to this data set, can't we? Is that anything? Yes, yeah, sort of. They do, a, they do an unbend likelihood already for every point on the sky, because they have uh, error regions that are associated with each event, right? And it's got a, you know, and there you can see that some of them are, are rather irregular on the sky. So I'm not it's, sure exactly it's, how it's they- It's like having a, a, field, a, a big field of view with, the, with varying PSI. And it, it's no worse than looking at Fermi data, uh, Fermi even list. Yeah. Um, I would think looking a little further down the process is is more as more fruitful territory than upstream of the process. Um, the Artson paper did the upstream of the process thing, and I think uh, the Spusan work is downstream of the process, and that uh, there's there's still useful work to do in the statistics downstream here. So you believe, you believe the uh, the p value and the the, 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 uh, the original thing that Artson did. I mean, you that, seems, that seems that seems quite reasonable. I looked at that in in in, uh, in in detail. I think that was in that's in that's this one. That one they didn't just calculate this uh, test statistic. 
They calculated the distribution of the test statistic. They said it has a chi-square with 1.5 degrees of freedom. I don't know where that comes from, but hey, you know, that's why you have so, 100, you know, 900 authors. <laughs> by the way, we have, we have a talk in next April uh, by Sarah Jerry's student, who is working on uh, figuring out the, the strength of the source without an explicit measurement uh, from an on-off background. So that might be relevant to this. So thank you. Mm, well, that just is, saying. That's, that's a talk in April. I'm just saying, they've got, they got a detailed part. There were several steps to it. I didn't want to write down all the steps because they looked very reasonable all along the way. And their answer was, was fairly mild. It's a it, simpler it, analysis too, because it's 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 just really looking at whether or not there's clumping in this field without bringing in all these questions about uh, the blazars. Right. Uh, I I don't know if I exact. I guess I have a question. I, I the 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 blazars and the 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 analysis you I guess you were calling it the downstream analysis or the upstream analysis, the, the one at the end of your talk. The, are the are the blazars pretty well defined? Yes. Because if you start with saying, you know, I guess you had 1177 blazars, right? We just say that we take those as given. That makes the problem a lot easier. Still a little complicated, but I agree with what you said uh, about your kind of that binomial calculation seems like a lot simpler way to go than uh, it has a lot fewer variables to select as well. Uh, you know, uh, so do you, the one thing I didn't understand also is how many, what are they, neutrinos are there in that data set? Because you, you were you said that there was one, there were 10, 10 that were hit. As they say, ten blazars that were hit by this population of uh, right. of neutrinos, but it sounds like there's an awful lot of neutrinos. Yeah, I don't remember the number, but uh, they need a p value, you know, uh, of some um, uh, ten to the minus four for getting uh, a possibility of a source at a given point, and so you're going to need a few, you're going to need quite a few events that over, have overlapping error regions in order to get that kind of uh, p-value. Because on your next slide, I guess that very last slide, you had the the, the area associated with the blazars uh, that it, four, you know, five times 10 to the minus five, and that, you multiply- That's associated with an individual hotspot of the neutrino hotspot. The, uh, oh, I see. Yeah, this this is a neutrino hotspot uh, portion of the sky. Yeah, I guess the way I would, I mean, maybe this is equivalent, but just the way I'm thinking about it is you each of those blazars has a little circle around it, essentially. You can imagine putting a circle around it. And if, if the um, neutrino is within that circle, it counts as a hit. And maybe that's the 0. 0.55 degree circle that you have there. And then you imagine you're you're tossing your your darts at the at the which are the individual neutrinos at all the little circles around all the neutrinos, and you you want to see what's the chance that you hit, however you know how what, I guess it was ten times there may, there may have been multiple neutrinos in individual blazars as well I don't know, but if if you're if you're throwing lots and lots of darts you know hundreds of thousands of darts maybe right. Uh, you know, you, you do have a pretty good chance of hitting it ten, hitting those things ten times. I would guess. Oh, so no, no. Uh, this, so this is this point uh, zero five six comes from assuming that every neutrino is uh, is separate. Yes, every. So if, if several of them overlap, then you're going to. They don't. Well, you, they, they they're drawn from this little map right here. You can see all the individual ones. They 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 are very they're very sparse. No, it's a sort of clusters. Right? It's, it's be... Each one consists of many, many events right. overlapping, overlapping probability distributions oh, for oh, each so event. Hot spot. Okay, that's the idea of the hot spot. Sorry. Yeah, that's a hot spot. Yeah. Right. So, oh, I see. So it's whether or not the hot spots land on top of one of the blazars. 
Yeah. So the way I look at it is the, the, the blazars are a bunch of points on the sky. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I, that I look at any given neutrino um, uh, region, and then I start throwing a thousand darts at it. I see. I say, the, the what's dark the chance of getting the, the... one of them into that neutrino's um, uh, region? That's the point of yeah, five six. The, yeah, your darts are the uh, neutri uh, the blazars. Yes, that's what I was. Looking I see. At. My dart, my darts for the neutrinos are neutrino hotspots, and I'm not sure <laughs> if it's obvious that one of those paradigms is better or not. But it, I think it does change the statistics substantially. That's a that's an interesting point, and I'm not sure how to go about looking at that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But that's an interesting point. I, just, I would say that either of those two things, those binomial calculations, seem quite a lot simpler than what they did. Uh, there's a lot fewer moving pieces, you know, variables that you have to select. The LVs and all these different L news, I guess they are, and uh, all these different things. Well, L -ins. yeah, the but the. Um, the twenty, the nineteen candidates came from their selection of this L min. That's uh, that's with four point zero. Um, the okay, nineteen. Can, they, that's the nineteen hotspots. Yeah, nineteen hotspots. That comes from L equals four. I see. So we would have to set that somehow as well. E by your penalty score. Somebody must have thought about something like this. It's 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 like you have two data sets and you're you you want to see how you know it's it's kind of like a correlation that you're computing about the locations. It it does seem to me, just on the face of it, without doing any calculations, it, it does look highly coincidental to think that you know that this would just happen without uh there actually being an association between the these blazars and the hotspots. Uh, but that assumes that there, there's no cherry picking, I guess. Yeah, um, this is why I bring it to statisticians who have maybe a higher level of um, uh, eth ethics <laughs> you know, when yeah, it comes yeah, to uh, yeah. defining your problem better. Yeah. Um, can I, I just say, I think David has hit the, the nail on the head. The, the simpler uh, statistical approach you use, the better, the fewer moving parts is a good way of saying it. Um, for, I wonder if a slight generalization of that binomial thing might be to look at the distribution of the distances, just the radial distances between the two samples. Is that sort of equivalent to what they did in terms of so-called cross-correlation analysis, or is that different? I, I think you've actually got a good point there, that um, it is like a two-point correlation, and all they're doing is only extending it to like a half a degree, yeah. or not even, not even a full degree. So... Uh, but, they, but if you... You looked at the distribution function of distances when the in the real data, and then did a a huge Monte Carlo thing, and and check out whether that distribution. This would be a you could do a bin free um, analysis of the differences in the distributions, and that that might be slightly more moving parts than, than what David was talking about. But um, so, but it does address it. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Well, looking at what nearest neighbors or something. Uh, well, that's, I, mean, I don't know if that, that's sort of overkill in a way. I mean, that I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I, yeah, you could define the statistic and very, I mean, because it would be really the Monte Carlo that matters, right? So, I mean, you, you essentially have <clears throat> the Monte Carlo, you would randomly just uniformly put the blazars and uniformly put the hotspots and figure out what, however you compute that correlation with nearest neighbors or however you compute that, that the, the total distances or whatever it is, uh, you just do the same thing with your actual data and see where it falls in that distribution. So you have a little bit of flexibility because you're, it's, it's completely from Monte Carlo. Um, the, the trick comes, it seems to me, in deciding what to include. So the blazars, it sounds like, are pretty well defined. You know, there's not... There's not questions about which ones to include. 
but the hot spots, there is a threshold that's being put down and that threshold might affect the significance. Okay. Do you have yeah. a question? Yeah, I just, I just, um, I'm, I'm trying to see if I understand this correctly. Um, so the point of this analysis is to understand if the blazer positions compared to the neutrino regions or blobs that we have uh, are random or that those are by chance or those have a, uh, they are, they are overlapping because that means something, right? Like the blazers yeah. and neutrino yeah. are uh, correlated. Because that's, that's... The, the step that occurs after this is they have these 10 candidates now right, that they found by this association method. And now they say, oh, hey, maybe they're interesting. Let's go look at each one and understand them physically and uh, in the light of the possibility that they are producing neutrinos. So they start, they use this to uh, to run off in another direction uh, that is the detailed analysis of these individual uh, possible associations, okay? Uh, because there's physics to understand. If, if these are truly neutrino sources, uh, you can understand them better by using that neutrino uh, flux information. To understand that the concern is that we wanna have those Cross correlation analysis, like uh, very reliably, and having yes. probabilities of yeah. those correlations yeah. uh, better. Uh, like those probabilities have to be more reliable than what we have now. Yeah, that, that's if, what I, I understand. if I can make a, a stupid analogy, if you if imagine you have a, um, a whole set of uh, cows, and say you have brown cows and black cows uh, and white ones. And you say, well, I want to find out which one tastes the best. And if you um, uh, if you sample only the brown ones, you say, oh, the brown ones are the ones that taste the best. And what you really want to know, does it matter what the color of the cow is um, as to whether or not um, uh, which one tastes, uh, tastes best? Sorry, maybe cows aren't too good. Maybe apples. How about apples? OK, make it better, more vegan. Um, um, is, is something I think it's kind of related to what we are working on with the name? Uh, are... Sort of, it's sort not of. that we have 100,000 sources here. Yeah, exactly, it's a different case. But if the concern is to have good probabilities, I think, I was thinking while the, the discussion was going that, um, so there is a way to complicate this even more by having like more reliable probabilities by modeling how the, the, the celestial, the, 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 the sky is as a sphere. And having a spherical the uh, probability uh, distribution. This this is what I was asking about earlier about uh -huh. going back to the original events and then working from them. Yeah. Uh, so I, there is this paper by in 20, 2018 by in which basically they do a Bayesian uh, method for giving uh, probabilities to cross match uh, astronomical catalogs, and I think this. This could be useful because they model the sky as a sphere and have a, a basically different mm -hmm. uh, point sources in which they have. If you know the the, the error you could model, those have like a probability distribution, like a PSF uh, around that source, and you can model the probabilities of other sources overlapping. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's probably a better way to uh, get probabilities for this kind of cross match. Um, they don't have probabilities for individual sources here. They just have probability for the set of them to be, on average, neutrino emission. You know, have, have a neutrino emission. So uh, I see. some of them, you know, are closer than others. But as long as they're within half a degree, it doesn't really matter. That's a that's an association in their mind. You know, based on, um, and so they're saying, hey. Uh, if they're that close, there's there, you know, we may expect one of these, but maybe all 10 are are real sources. I see. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit of a different problem because we don't have like point sources, but definitely like modeling, probably starting from modeling the sky in this kind of simpler uh, cases, like it's modeling as a sphere and having a a spherical distribution for each source would be a way to probably 
get a better test statistic at the end. Mm -hmm. So something like that would be what about like the what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. I, I, not, I, I have asked my own doctor to read our senator and understand what that is. So maybe you should. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we are at one twenty-seven. I think we should stop here. Uh, any last minute questions for Arman? Uh, suggestions, thoughts? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, thank you, Herman, for the very nice presentation. Uh, okay. And uh, I guess we will, the next time we will meet will be in January. Um, wow. Yeah. So have a nice uh, holidays and uh, see you all later. Happy New Year. Yes. Thanks, Jim. <sighs> Next time. Bye-bye. Next time, concordance.